Hello. Uh, I am sorry I'm not visible at the moment. I'm hoping my camera will uh, will come on shortly. Um, but yes, uh, thanks, David. Thanks for passing over there. And a really interesting way to to start the uh, to start the discussion today uh, with that from from Gertrude Koopman. Um, so yes, we are going to be talking about uh, sovereign debt management and the path back to uh, to normality uh, after. Uh, quite a remarkable period over the last two years, and I think um, I think it's fair to say that the next uh, the next the next year or so will be um, will be just as remarkable. Uh, hoping my camera will. Um, I'll stop and start. There we go. Uh, yes. Thanks everyone for slight delay there. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I'm joined by a fantastic panel here. We've got uh, Ayla Creevy of the EIB, uh, Christian Vellner uh, from uh, the Fennens Agentur and uh, Brian Magviro and from, uh, from Bearings. Um, so if we just go around, um, I think, um, as I said at the start, the, the last couple of years with COVID-19 has seen some, uh, some really remarkable uh, expansions to, to borrowing programs. And as we move towards a situation where the pandemic remains a part of our lives, but, but a smaller part, uh, it's fair to say that the borrowing programs are, are coming back towards normality. Uh, but um, yeah, let's, let's get your perspective on that. And if you can introduce yourselves and we'll just go around. Ayla, if you want to, to kick off. You're on, you're on mute. Okay, that's how every panel starts. Somebody's on mute. Every time. Okay, so good morning, everybody, and thank you, Omfif, uh, for this invitation. Um, so I'm Ella Credi, head of head of capital markets at the EIB, still at least for for a few more days. And um, uh, so, um, well, uh, what should I say there? Well, we have been EIB has been uh, responding to the crisis uh, with a with a slightly different, not uh, not uh, just in expanding our funding program. We decided then and there when this pandemic started and decisions had to be taken quite rapidly, of course, that we will put in place a guarantee program, uh, which is pan-European guarantee program, and um, for, for, for especially corporates uh, who were just seeing their clients vanishing overnight and seeing their markets vanishing overnight and had uh, <clears throat> um, especially liquidity problems rather than sort of long-term survival problems. And this um, uh, guarantee program, of course, meant that <clears throat> the implications for our funding program were pretty non-existent. So we went through the crisis with a fairly similar funding needs than we did before. Uh, and and uh, the, the guarantee fund has now been pretty much finalized and done. It has worked quite well. We have gotten good feedback for it. Um, and in terms of the funding volumes, actually, we are this year we have now uh, forecasted needs of uh, 45 billion euros, which is the lowest since all this crisis began. So it's uh, we need to go pre-pandemic, pre-European crisis, pre-global financial crisis. Uh, it was the last time we had such a low program. Uh, so it actually takes some learning to, to go that low again. Um, and and uh, in fact, we had uh, last year even a negative, uh, negative funding program, quite almost 10 billion. This year we are going to be around zero because on the other hand, we have had the big lending that we did during the European crisis in particular, those loans have matured and come back, which meant that we had, uh, we had plenty of positive cash flow and did not need that much new funding. So that's our situation where we are slightly different from, from, from some other peers who have had uh, different programs. And um, so we are in a fairly comfortable situation right now, um, at least in terms of not needing to grow tremendously. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Christian, can I pass over to you to talk about your experience over the last couple of years? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I can, can make a, um, um, a full stop to, to almost any sentence Ala, Ala um, already said. Um, very, um, very interesting times, very challenging times. Uh, Germany has um, just announced uh, the issuance plans for, for 2022 a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the, the plans are around about um, around about 410 plus uh, plus a volume in, in, in four syndicated transactions, which is um, also pre um, much. It's, it's almost double the size we had pre-crisis. So 
to just to compare the numbers, we in 2019 we had a, a gross an annual an annual issuance volume of 202 billion, and within the year 2020 it jumped up to 406. Last year the the overall um, a record year was uh, 480 83 around about a billion, and now coming back to coming back to 410 plus minus something. Uh, about uh, about a syndicated transaction. So the path to normalization is far away uh, from uh, regarding just looking into the from from the volumes. Um, the, the reason for that is is similar. I mean, um, this is one of the biggest crises we have ever seen. Germany as and the government of Germany reacted um, by establishing an economic stabilization fund. Um, so there are two pillars we have to 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 fund. We have to fund this this economic stabilization fund. And of course, there's uh, additional needs within the budget itself. So uh, lower taxes and, and all this uh, and, and higher um, higher expenditures um, for health and, and things like that. So this was the um, this was the interesting um, part of it. And um, I mean, even if um, even if the, the net the net need for uh, within the budget and the um, um, and this, and the fund will be reduced significantly in the next in the next year we still have to do a way of, of this path to normalization because um we as a as a debt management agency reacted as many issuers did uh, we boosted we boosted the short end um, of the issuance and the short end of the curve with our build program so and therefore you have to slightly transfer this volume which always uh, can generate redemptions a year by year um, we have to transfer this into the normal portfolio structure again. So therefore, um, if you ask me, uh, this is this is yeah, I, I was talking about numbers, which is very public to the to all the community outside to the investors. But if you ask me personally as a debt manager, what is normalization? Normalization means for me having flexibility in in putting my portfolio together, sticking our heads together. What are the best? What is the best mix of maturities um, for the German taxpayer? And uh, and for the for the investors outside and uh, these two years we had now seen was was almost just get the money um, um, as much as you can and put any any invest any instrument to the maximum. We introduced new new lines for seven years and fifteen years, and now we're hoping that we're just coming back to our business as usual, uh, which which means um, yeah, which means good portfolio uh, portfolio management and good debt, debt portfolio management. Um, in the favor of, of taxpayers' money. Yeah, still some extraordinary volumes to be raised, though. Um, yeah, Brian, um, let's let's hear from you. It's been interesting to note that uh, despite the huge volumes that have been raised over the past couple of years, it seemed like uh, markets have been pretty receptive to it, and uh, and investors have been fairly happy to to meet these large needs. So, what's what's your perspective on on how the last two years were in that respect? Um, so yeah, um, my name is Brian Manguira and I'm a portfolio manager with Bearings. Uh, we look at global sovereigns and currencies and uh, we also delve into credit. Uh, so this is very much uh, bread and butter for us. The, um, you mentioned a very good point in terms of uh, the seemingly insatiable demand for, um, for, for sovereigns. I think um, when the crisis hit, um, a lot of us as portfolio managers, what we were thinking about was what would be the outlook for the global economy and in terms of sovereign solvency and uh, for europe in particular what we were impressed by was the decisiveness with which they they attacked the crisis like if you looked at europe in 2012 2011 it was quite dysfunctional in terms of decision making very slow this time around they came in really hard suspended the fiscal compact and they just went in there um, to with all the various crisis tools. So from a portfolio manager's perspective, you're thinking, okay, the outlook is going to be good for Europe, and that gives you the confidence to go and buy periphery. So what we saw was uh, a large issuance, um, especially across Europe, uh, and a large terming out of debt as well as sovereigns were taking advantage of the extremely low interest rates and very accommodative, uh, accommodative um, uh, monetary policy that, that was being implemented. So to us, that was very encouraging. Now, were we surprised by that uh, such a huge demand? No. 
um, because you have to think that on the one side, central banks were expanding their balance sheets aggressively, like with record amounts. So all that cash had to find a home. And in most cases uh, for, for institutions, they are mostly looking for safe assets. So sovereigns become, uh, become um, uh, the, a good place to go. We also saw a lot of buying coming in from Asia, also taking advantage of these falling bond yields and rising prices. And from a hedge perspective, I mean, the yield pickup was still this decent for Japanese investors. So the, the, there is, um, the, the, structurally, there is the, the optimism you have that the crisis response tools have stabilized and they improve the sovereign outlook, especially if you're looking at Italy and Greece, that's a focus on Europe. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, you're also looking for the hunt for yield uh, for institutional investors and for some of European pension funds who are, we, we view them as gated investors, they just have to buy this stuff. So mm. we're really not surprised with the, with the demand, but also that demand is well supported by the economy and also the ECB uh, backstop and sovereigns. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to stick with you, Brian, because I'd like to uh, get your thoughts on what's coming this year. You know, some of the dynamics you mentioned in terms of the accommodative of monetary policy, etc., uh, might not be in, in play to the same degree. So are you expecting, yeah, how much more turbulence are you expecting? We're seeing yields rise already. Uh, uh, Christian's 10-year debt paying a positive yield for the first time since, I don't know, a couple of years at least, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so so global bond markets, especially in developed world, are quite uh, quite correlated. So if you have bond rising bond yields in Europe and in the, in the US, Europe is likely to follow, but at a slightly lower beta. Uh, in terms of what um, what the outlook is for monetary policy and how it might impact bond yields, first we we think that the ECB is going to remain quite accommodating major central banks. So what's priced into uh, OIS markets at the moment is one hike or 125 basis points hike per year into 2023, and then nothing happens. So effectively looking at the terminal cash rate, it's uh, around 25 basis points. That's for the ECB. Now, if you compare the Fed, we're looking at 2% terminal rates. So, so effectively, what am I saying? The, 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 the market sees the ECB in a different place to say the UK, Australia, or the US, or even Canada. And, and that is likely to give investors confidence that if they were to buy European fixed income, at least they'll be well protected. Now, going forward, we expect inflation to also be, I don't want to say a problem, but healthy in Europe versus the past. And that in itself may create some expectation that the ECB might respond to it. So there's going to be some turbulence. It's not going to be a quiet zone. But at the end of the day, if you look at the central bank communication, I think the ECB has been very clear. Madame Lagarde has been very, very clear that it's unlikely to go anywhere. And I believe her. So, so and I think a lot of investors believe, believe her as well. So that, that means, at least if you're invested in Europe, you're likely to be better protected than if you were in the US. Now, the inflation profile, when we look at it in, in Europe, at least most of it looks to be energy energy driven and to the extent that there are no second round effects we expect inflation to peter out and that in itself as well takes pressure of the ecb to just jump on uh, in high rates so it's it's going to be an interesting uh, d d d um uh, market going uh, going through this year there's going to be some volatility but at the end of the day with ecb still buying i think the market is going to be well supported enough for for, for issue issuance to be well absorbed at least that's my perspective Excellent. Well, thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll go to Elena and um, yeah, with with the dynamics that, that Brian is talking about, not too concerned about inflation. I mean, it must be hard to, to get concerned about in, inflation in Europe, given, you know, many, many years of EC poli ECB policy falling short. But it is more of a factor now than it's been. Uh, I understand the start of the year has been very successful, but how does investors you know, some more expectation of inflation change the, the dynamic of, of the bond market view. Are the new tenors available or more difficult to access than in previous years? So was that for me? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, it's, it's, uh, it has barely started the year and we did a very little, if anything, at the end of the year when the inflation talk started to emerge more and more. Um, 
so we haven't really tested that much yet. We have done a sort of a pretty traditional deal so far. And of course, we also do multi-currency business. So not everything is, is, is in euros for us. But from what we hear is that, yes, it might be tougher this year to go to the ultra long maturities, um, which can be anything starting from 15 years to go to 50, I don't know. Uh, that these 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 are of course the first victims because inflation does not need to happen. People only need to think that it's a possibility because for ten years that word was not on anybody's radar screen. Now you can't read a newspaper without uh, without seeing the word and and uh, and having somebody analyzing whether there is or is not whether it's uh, permanent or temporary. So that's all we need. But but uh, I agree with with uh, with Brian that I think to some extent it would be healthy to have some. Um, what kind of inflation is a, is, a, is a question, I don't know. Energy prices are one thing, but then, of course, we have seen, at least in other countries, that also the uh, pressures on wages are quite high and, and uh, quite uh, in unexpectedly one, one suffers uh, sort of um, skills shortages or workforce shortages. We also saw this in the EIB investment survey, which is our sort of flagship uh, publication in the economic uh, research, which came out last week, that there were quite a lot of European corporates companies who are suffering from shortage uh, of, of skills. They don't find skilled labor that they need to find. I mean, uh, at the same time, they have cut training uh, budget, which is, of course, logical. Uh, but this may lead to some uh, increased pressures in, in, in wages. Um, so uh, I think it's 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 all these things. They are kind of a weak signals, and it may be temporary. It may not be further than this. But I think the the, the pure existence of the word in our vocabulary again after a ten year break uh, is is something that 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 means something. And uh, well, we are in a lucky situation in that sense that we don't really need the very ultra long funding because. We are an intermediary and we look at the Euribor result rather than the fixed cost. So it, it, it's, it, it's different uh, different for us. Uh, but this is what, what we are hearing right now, that the most visible impact would be in getting access to large amount of very long term funding. That the, um, if not the quantity yet, maybe the quality of the investor base is, is suffering uh, a little bit in terms of uh, fast money, um, more patient money. Because, of course, if you think that inflation, even that the risk is there, and if you want to buy a 30-year bond at, um, you know, or no yield at all, uh, then then you may think twice, uh, uh, even even if you want to hold it for two weeks and sell it at, at, at a profit, that might be tougher than it was last year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Christian, what, what's your perspective on, on that? Do you have uh, designs on ultra-long uh, debt this year? No, we haven't. Um, we haven't uh, published um, any plans for for doing these ultra longs. Uh, we are looking into the market. Um, this is this is a topic which come came up um, every um, every year at the year end when we make our press conference, and um, we, we always give the same answer. It looks boring, but it is it is as it is. We are looking to that market. We are looking if if um, ultra long could help us in the job. We can do which is which is making our our mix in the portfolio a better um, um, and um, yeah I mean you can do risk reduction as well with with 30 years I mean if you look to our to our um, issuance volumes in the last years so here you you might find that um, the issuance um, of, of 30 year of, of long our long end of the curve not the ultra long but the long end of the curve has been massively um, uh, massively increased. So therefore, there has been some some risk reduction uh, done um, already. Um, the question is, does um, does ultra long help from a pure from a pure portfolio perspective? It, it has some nice aspects, but on the other hand, you have to um, you have to keep in mind that, that Germany is a is the benchmark issuer in in the in the whole euro area, and therefore, if Germany is coming with a new product, um, it, it shouldn't be opportunistic. It should be a very reliable um, issuer and, and giving um, the, the message outside to the to the investors that if Germany is coming with a new product, it will be it will be a strategic issuance as it has been with the with inflation linked uh, program, for example, and and it is also there with the with the green bonds we're we're already issuing. So therefore, um, um, yeah, ultra long is always a topic for us in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the analysis teams, and we're looking to that continuously and. Um, 
but we didn't have any any um, uh, plans announced for, for for this year which yeah but, but this does not mean that this this is uh, written in stone for, for for any time sure sure absolutely um brian i was wanting to ask uh with this turbulence you know yields are coming up already how much more are you expecting them to to come up in this sector it's a bit of a yeah, bit of a crystal ball, but yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's a tough question. Uh, it, within bearings, I'm known as one of the most bearish people when it comes to uh, bond markets. I, I expect yields to be to, to to be going up much more significantly. Um, that's a difficult question. The if the ECB delivers on what it says, I don't think you get. Uh, t- it's going above 25 basis points. But that also depends on how high US treasuries go because at some point the spread between the two just doesn't make any sense. And then, you know, boons have to follow. So I expect yields to go up a little bit more. And why do I expect that? I think it's it's what um, um, what's being said about the, the, the inflation debate that it's the fear of inflation that then drives the, the bond yields higher. That's number one. Number two is Europe's growth outlook is really strong. In terms of forecasts, we expect Europe to outperform the US at least in 2022 and 23. And that's all due to this decisiveness that the Europe has brought to it. Uh, you know, deploying this uh, recovery funds and then the ECB staying accommodative, supporting the economy. All of these, I think they add up to supporting a much stronger growth outlook for Europe. And that in itself should just translate to higher bond yields. But is it going to be crazy higher bond yields? No. Uh, if the just wanted to echo the uh, the Christian's comments about the the, the, uh, the long end, I think the long end becomes challenging if you're holding a zero and uh, a zero coupon bond, and with all that duration, it behaves like an equity basically. And especially when you know the direction of bond yields, it's almost like real stuff. But uh, from a portfolio manager's perspective, sometimes you want that duration because really you need to hedge the portfolio because you never know what's around the corner. So what I would expect is I expect, uh, you know, in terms of bid covers to diminish a little bit. Uh, we saw that with that 10 year Greek um, bond yesterday where, you know, the demand almost halved when you look at bid cover. But I think I also expect some hedging programs to become stronger with time. I.e., people buy these bonds, but then they go and pay swaps to hedge their, their interest rate risk. So it doesn't mean that buyers will diminish, but hedging programs will become much more pronounced. So um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question uh, uh, much more precisely, but yes, I expect higher bond yields to come through. I do not expect Europe to have crazy higher bond yields because of the ECB's actions and the just general expectations. But I also do not expect that to be a big hit to demand because there are various ways to hedge your interest rate risk should this risk materialize. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's, I mean, it doesn't sound like we're going to be in the stage where uh, that sustainability becomes an issue quickly, but I just want to get you know the, the perspective of, of the panelists on the idea that you know we've in the aggregate debt in the sector is, is much much higher than it was a few years ago, and if uh, if the cost of refinancing is is going to climb, uh, when does debt sustainability become an issue? It might not be uh, your institutions that are uh, <laughs> likely to be the, the first that people look to in this context, but uh, just in the in from from a market aggregate perspective, uh, Christian, would you like to address that? Uh, thank you that you asked the AAA um, issue <laughs> for that question. Sure. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah. Um, what happens if 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 interest rates are rising? I mean, I I look to this discussion. We all here around, and and uh, it's not here in this in this conference. It's every everywhere. Um, any, anybody is nervous, and, and their interest rates will rise, and and anybody is 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 cautious about that. Um, uh, footnote: um, If I look to the to the to the forward rates, um, it's just a few basis points at the end of the year. So therefore, um, 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 this is this is really an interesting uh, an interesting point. So therefore, um, I mean, um, we are we are. I can only talk, of course, for Germany. But uh, at the end of the day, we are a continuous issuer. So we have to deal with the market we are faced with. That's our job. We cannot change interest rates. What what we can change is is the setup of our portfolio, and and that is that is the only way we can deal with that. And we can offer perhaps a little bit. Uh, we can hear to the market. So the investor needs. What do you need for for uh, uh, for uh, what, which kind of products do you need? 
and um, um, Brian is completely right. Um, offering ultras is is perhaps a little bit more challenge would be a little bit more challenging right now. But any you, you said um, some investors need the duration, and I would add the convexity is of course and an also an interesting topic for for that. But being faced with uh, with uh, uh, with rising yields, I mean this is this is something uh, which we uh, which we are used to. I mean. Um, uh, and it's it's in the press. It's in the press when German ten-year yield is, is is in the positive on a positive yield. Yes, we had this in 2017 as well, and we survived. Um, I mean, I I do this this business and this job uh, since for for 20 years now, and I just looked into the into the in the to the chart um, for 20 uh, 20 years ago. The ten-year bond yield was 4.5 percent. So therefore, um, and and we still and we still and we still survived. And I think all the debt manager colleagues I, I know are very adaptive to 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 handle this 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 ways. And um, I'm completely with Brian. I don't see any much massive spikes and and massive jumps in in interest rate right uh, rates mm -hmm. about more than 100 basis point up. This could be. This could be a, a problem um, more for the market itself than that for the for the signal issuer, I would suppose. Yeah. If if the transition is going is going slowly, I have the um, I'm very much convinced that that any any issuer or any creditor, uh, if you want, uh, is able to adopt to the to the new situation and um, and 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 doing what's what 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 he needs to in into the topics he can influence and, and what he can influence is. Is the mix of the is the mix of the instruments yeah. so the portfolio, and on the other side it's a political question the 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 the, um, the the volume of debt of course but this is um, um, as we in Germany are separated from the political view so this is a so this is a different question um, but at the end of the day I'm I'm very convinced that uh, that you in the euro area the debt portfolios are all very resilient. Ayla, is there anything you'd like to, to add on that point? I mean, I suppose in a sense, you guys are a little more, well, you, you, yeah, as a, as a lender, it's a little bit of a different situation for you guys. Yes, it, it is indeed. Of course, I mean, we all uh, get to get the, 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 the impact through the, what the investors feel and how they behave. Uh, but for us as, as an intermediary, this doesn't really make that much difference. If, um, in, in fact, I have to say that in this situation where everything is so compressed also because of the, the, the central bank measures, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's very difficult to have any differentiation when you, your client is paying uh, almost the same for your money as we are and we had like seven degrees difference in, in ratings. So, but, but, so in, a, in that sense, having slightly higher rates and having some differentiation would actually be not such a bad thing to have mm. but but the um looking at it from the financial point of view directly from the funding point of view the level of interest rate is not that um sort of a straightforward fast and yes i think somebody said it earlier already that well investors might like to have a bit more yield so i'm not too concerned about losing investors because they will most of them have to invest money somehow in something and if you get slightly more for your for your for your money they probably would be um not yeah. too unhappy about that part at least yeah i think uh Gertian made that point in the in the panel before us um on on the topic of uh of the eu uh that's obviously been one of the the biggest changes over the past uh the past couple of years um the the picture of yeah the 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 capital markets have become quite busy in with, with them as a new issuer and the the volumes that they're raising uh how does that a, a change your approach to the market and i think you know a few people have mentioned that there's going to be more turbulence this year is there more competition for funding windows or funding windows shorter how do you manage that uh do you want to talk about that um, yes, <clears throat> since the uh, commission started, uh, there, there was of course plenty of questions in the air. How will this impact uh, the availability of funding? What investors will think, and all of that. We have now seen this going on for for for, for a while, and um, availability of funding has not really been an issue. And of course, we are in a slightly different size class than the commission in in terms of our needs as well. But uh, you are right about the funding window. So that is uh, 
now that also the NGEU is in full force. Funding windows, when you take out the sort of public holidays in the main countries, you take out the sort of uh, main auctions by, 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 by member states, you take out then the, the, the commission windows, and then, well, you are not left with that many days in the calendar anymore. So you have to be very nimble. Um, uh, and, and that is really the biggest impact that we see. We have to look at the calendar very carefully. When are we going to go out? Now, we have fortunately quite sort of a <clears throat> short turnaround times. Uh, we go into the market very quickly. We take the money. We don't need to do 5 billion or heaven forbid 10 billion every time. We, we are happy with our 3, 4 uh, billion and, and, and get out. So that's not too, uh, too uh, sort of demanding. It works quite well. And for the first time in my professional life, I think EIB is seen as having some scarcity value, which I thought I'd never see this day, but there it is. So. And I suppose being a multi-currency issuer makes that uh, makes it a little bit easier. Um, yeah, yeah, Christian, as a you predominantly use auctions, um, does that uh, and and that's I think even more the case this year than than last year. Um, what, what what's the position there? And uh, in terms of finding funding windows, that's obviously different to, to the syndication model. So yeah, how, how does this uh, how does this shape up for you? Yeah, I mean, um, and, um, not really much to to, to add what 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 Ayla already mentioned. Um, of course, uh, Germany as as the um, benchmark issuer is is st the standard of, of placement bonds is the auction is the auction format with the with the already published uh, calendar. So anybody could uh, could could see when Germany is, is coming to the market with auctions. And um, what I hear from from colleagues is that yeah, some people are are, are um, arranging around that or, or try to, to, to avoid that, that, that points. And then, yeah, we have announced four syndications um, this year. I mean, there will be, um, there will be um, room for uh, NGU and Germany to find windows, I would suppose. But yes, you're right. I mean, um, of course, we are doing um, calls with pot potential lead managers um, um, upfront and, and trying to talk about the market and timing is something which is um, more on the on the topic list than it was two years two years ago. Excellent, thank you, um, Brian. I think I, I cut you off when you were going to say something on the on the um, we were talking about the sort of debt sustainability picture. Did you want to add something there? Uh, just a little bit. Uh, so first, I wanted to say if I called for four percent bond yields, I think that would be the end of my job. So I couldn't be able to do that. <laughs> But I think, uh, so first of all, debt sustainability, I come to it from uh, a non-economist perspective. I, I just get things from a sort of plain vanilla um, perspective. And, and, and what is that? I think debt sustainability is an issue when growth is weak. That's number one. So what Europe has done, loosening the fiscal compact and all of these next-gen EU projects, I think that raises the growth profile. And when there's growth, more growth, there's more receipts and more money to pay for, uh, you know, for, pay for this debt. So nobody gets concerned. So where I come to, I, I, where I, I, the way I look at it is to say, it is the strong, gro the, the, the growth outlook that we should be worried about. And for Europe, that's really good. And for that reason, I would not be worried about debt sustainability over the next few years. What I would be worried about is if I started seeing Europe coming back to the fiscal compact quicker and more aggressive, because that just, I think that puts periphery at risk. And that goes to my next point, which is uh, DSA is only going to be an issue probably for Italy and Greece and maybe Portugal and Spain, maybe. But otherwise, I think the rest of Europe, this is a, a debate that was back then. And, and now I would say it, it might never come back if things continue as uh, and then the final point is, what, how, how would the ECB respond if they saw bond yielding in a way that would destabilize sovereigns? You know, they're really vigilant against uh, financial fragmentation. So I believe that if you started seeing such a situation, the ECB would come in. So there's already an internal control mechanism there. So that's why, again, DSA for me, uh, it's, it's, it's no longer an issue to consider. Mm, yeah, there, there does seem to have been... Um... A really amazing shift in uh, the mentality of policymakers towards, you know, away from uh, austerity and fiscal consolidation towards uh, a more fiscally expansive growth promoting, uh, you know, high borrowing and high spending uh, attitude. Um, I guess, yeah, I, I mean, I suppose that's, uh, 
you know that that's a decision taken at the political level not at the not at the debt management level um but uh yeah i mean in terms of uh christian in terms of the, the sort of changes towards uh higher borrowing i mean yeah germany has the the debt break but that's been i believe relaxed for uh, for a couple of years uh with the with the pandemic are you expecting that to come back in and and how does that i mean obviously you just have to fund what they ask you to fund but um yeah how does that change uh change your job i mean the, the, the short answer could be not at all um but i try to to give a more a more balanced answer to to, to that to that um um especially i cannot talk about germany so the what is our job as debt managers is we we we, we are faced with a number we have to fund so and the number we have to fund is, is uh, do some simplification, but it is the redemption we are faced with uh, plus uh, plus the the, the net uh, debt, uh, which is which is um, not decided by us, which is not decided by by the government. It is decided by the sovereign, which is represented um, 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 in, the, uh, uh, in the in the Bundestag. So it is a budget law where um, uh, where um, the sovereign is deciding how, how many debt we will have. So full stop, first mm -hmm. of all. And then we had this, um, this, um, this, this discussions uh, you meant about debt break. Um, also, we have the, um, 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 there's something on the, on the European um, level as well. And of course, this has affected the, the, the net borrowing in the, in the couple of years before pre-crisis. But um, I mean, um, um, all the people who made these laws were smart enough to put to put in some some extra uh, parts with what happens in a crisis uh, mode, and that it's, and it's pretty clear that in a, in a, in a case of a cri in, in case of crisis, you have to you have to uh, to react different. And um, I mean, um, you can can debate very much how long this crisis will be, and when when we do we have to take. take take uh, um, pack back the path to normalization but it's undebatable that we are within a, within a, a big crisis where we're faced with that so therefore um um, um of course um, and and this is why why this happens i mean this 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 high um um jump in the volumes from around about 200 to 400 um we, which which we managed and now it's again a, a political discussion um, how to how to come back uh, that the Schulden break uh, Schulden debt break uh, in Germany constitution is um, um, is uh, set aside due to the crisis um, till till next year. So and therefore we will see what the new um, um, what the new borrowing needs will be when we see the new when we see the new budget law. Um, apologies, I am still here, but uh, my camera appears to have. Uh, to have gone off for a moment. I'm just trying to get that. Uh, so yeah. I mean, this is this is the kind of uh, uh, this is the kind of normalization um, perhaps we we have in our in our um, headline uh, regarding to this to this uh, point. Perhaps this is this is the part um, um, coming back to to normal debt ratios, uh, whatever normal means. Um, and um, Additional to the to the to the fact that I already described that we have to transfer all these um, these short term volume into the back into the structure. Back, brilliant, brilliant timing. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. I think um, maybe I could get uh, your perspective, Brian, on uh, with this new attitude. Is there a perception that people can run? Uh, higher debt ratios more safely than people maybe thought in the past, uh, and um, yeah, will that will that change as, as rates climb, or yeah, what, what's your perspective there? That's that's a tough question, but uh, I, I don't know who said that the deficit is big enough to look after itself. Uh, I think it was Reagan or somebody, and I think I would quote quote the same that when growth is good, uh, then these ratios just improve by themselves, which is why I think it's all it's all about growth. It's all about growth. And all of this investment that you see in Europe, if it translates to good growth, then I think you will just see the ratios stabilize. Um, from an investor's perspective, I think you're right that in 2012 or 2011, 2012, when there was the Eurozone crisis, everybody was churning out a spreadsheet about DSA. That was the only thing we talked about. But that's also because the ECB. So, so now the the framework has has changed a little bit because now we know there's a sovereign backstop. 
but we also know that there is fiscal responsibility being talked about at the political level. So there's a nice balance to this. Um, I think you will still see uh, Europe trying to come back to sustainable debt ratios. That's not going to be suspended. But I think the pace at which you, you are going to see fiscal consolidation is going to take into account the potential damages that can come from aggressive fiscal consolidation. Mm -hmm. So I think you're likely to see a more, not a religious interpretation of the, of the rule book, but a more pragmatic uh, uh, implement, implementation of, of, of these policies. So for, for us, these investors, it's quite reassuring when people are not black and white about it, but to say, well, like the lower debt ratios, but we also like people to have jobs. And I think that's that that's where the conversation is going. And that pragmatism is reassuring for the long term. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I should just uh just add I mean the, the rule book we're talking about here is the stability and growth pact, right? Which yeah. is supposed yes. to limit um borrowing to uh three three percent uh of GDP per year. And there's uh, I believe the cap is sixty percent. And if you're sixty percent debt to GDP ratio and if you're over that it's to be reduced by a twentieth part per year. But yeah, that's it's quite an aggressive trajectory of of um uh, well, normalization is maybe one word for it, but possibly not the uh, uh, quite an aggressively austere trajectory. Um, Ayla, it's not uh, obviously you're you know not a borrower that's uh, affected by the stability and growth pact. But um, what, what's your perspective on this this issue of uh, relaxing you know European debt rules like that to to promote growth? Uh, well, on this one, I can only have personal opinions. I mean, sure. this is not yeah. really something that the EIB has, but views on. Um, I think I, I, I can understand both sides. I mean, I, I'm, I come from Finland, who is one of the sort of frugal, frugal countries. Um, and I understand that also the point that, that one should not take debt endlessly. Uh, on the other hand, of course, one needs to get certain things going. We, we need to get the green transition going. We need to get the sort of technical transition, the digitalization, uh, that transition going in Europe. Um, and, and investment is needed in sort of big things like infrastructure for, for, for both of these uh, purposes. Uh, the, again, the, the problem is, of course, that if you say that these are the ones where you could invest and take more debt, then how do you prove that these are the, what you do with the, with the money and the impact and the outcome is the one that you desired? Uh, so uh, I, I, I don't want to say anything very sort of a, um, black or white 100% yes or no. But I think if such rules are being made, then one should really make sure that, that, that the money goes to the right purpose and it's not going to pay salaries or pensions or whatever. And I think that is a, probably quite a tall order, but, uh, but I think that then that, that, and that is probably what most people would be struggling with. How do you show that? So that's just my personal opinion, as I said. Mm, yeah. Um, well, you've you've brought us into the area of uh, you know what the money should be spent on, and you mentioned the the green transition. Uh, yeah, the green market is obviously the green bond market has uh, really exploded over the past few years. And um, uh, you know, Christian, you're a, a relatively a relatively new issuer to the green bond market. I mean, it's a it's a year or two now, I think. But um, uh, yeah, what what did entering that market I mean, obviously, you know, Germany has been investing in in green projects for for longer than they've been issuing green bonds. So, what did uh, entering that market uh, mean for you guys? Yeah, very good, um, very good question. And um, it uh, took some time to to come to the market. That's that's correct. So, other peers were um, were early starters um, in the, um, uh, at this green bond market, and the reason was. Um, we took the time to, to say, what can we as benchmark issuer contribute to the growth of the market? Um, and uh, we had the feeling that that um, just copy pasting something is not enough for our for our coming to the coming to the market and giving that approach to to, to that. And therefore, we took some time um, to to find um, to find the right approach. Uh, or we think it's 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 good for us as, um, as as an issuer at the end of the day for the German taxpayer, and um, but also for the for, for the market development, uh, which means um, issuing green bonds uh, delivers a transparency about how the money how how money is spent, um, of course. 
Um, but what we what we also uh, like very much is giving the transparency about uh, about pricing and about how this this the, the asset uh, the valuable of the um, how valuable is this asset and I do um, I, I do not agree I, I disagree with with um, uh, direct, Director General Koopman who said uh, we don't care about the greenium. Um, we don't we do care very much because it is one of our key points that um that you you're, um, um i think it was uh, it was um you talked about the big imbalance in this market so and we have to do tremendous um tremendous transition into uh, over the whole economy and this costs a lot of billions of billions of, of, of money so therefore you have to um and, and and we have just seen the start of the of the market so they have to bring all all um parts in the in the economic chain you have to bring them together and if you want to raise these uh, enormous tremendous amount of money you have to you have to raise um issuers who come to the market companies banks who are who are really doing the doing the difference um i mean you, you already mentioned of course there's was, was always a part of the german budget was 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 already green and um we have proven that we can we can fund um any any investment at the lowest levels so uh, why just we are we doing that? And we're doing that because we are convinced that if we as Germany with the lowest interest rates can show that you can even fund a little bit, it's a little bit uh, uh, less, that could, that could be a starting point for, for other issuers coming to the market and say, well, this, this could make, uh, um, uh, uh, let's be part of that game and let's, let's, uh, join, this, let's join this market. Um, even not, uh, I mean, Germany has, has used this twin bond concept. Nobody has to has to has to copy that. But uh, bringing this transparency into the market was a very much key factor in our approach, and it took it took some time to to develop that. Um, but uh, but at the end of the day, we are very happy with that, and um, um, seeing seeing um, having very much more more transparency in the market you don't have to do spline interpolation between the erb curve and or, or whatever or, or a kfw curve and, and something like that you see it just you can just look to the secondary market and see well um there is an added value uh, and the investors um are are willing and, and are able to 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 price that added value and perhaps that's uh, that's something which other issuers um are just now standing at the sideline of the of the mm. game if you if you like that that picture coming into it and helping us uh, to 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 fund this enormous um um amount of money you, which is needed yeah um i just want to uh, interject briefly to to say to the audience that are asking questions uh thank you for doing so we will come to them in just a moment i just want to uh hear from from ayla and brian on the on the green bond topic because um uh, Ayla, that's going to be your uh, your new full time job in a few days, right? Um, well, not only green bonds, but green everything. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and your perspective on the uh, well, yeah. Look, can can we hear a little bit about your thoughts on um, on the finance agentures model for this this twin structure that that gives this display <laughs> of the the premium between uh, between the green curve and the conventional curve. Um, I'm quite neutral on 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 such things. How how uh, each issuer structures their green bonds and and this twin bond structure. Uh, I think it's all all fine, and I understand very well why Finance Agentur has done this. Uh, and uh, we, we didn't go into the green bond program well 15 years ago now with with the pricing in our thoughts because I mean we never knew what this was going to be anyways. Um, it was really about the transparency and telling that this is this is what we do and to show how how we do it. Uh, but I think the, the, the important thing is that one uh, does the green investments, uh, does the green transition, that's the number one thing. Then how you finance it is the second step. But you can finance it with green bonds and you can finance it with traditional whatever borrowings. But if you do green bonds, then you'd better do it well. And to show what is the use of the, your funds, to show proper reporting and uh, advance the course because it's not only a borrowing exercise it's an exercise in transparency and sharing this information with your investors and not only investors but the whole world basically so uh so if you do it with twin bonds fine if you do without twin bonds also fine with me all the rest is is more important and the most important thing is that those investments get done 
and then we can discuss how we finance them. But of course, there's a correlation. The more you issue green bonds, the more you probably do green type of investments. But governments, of course, have plenty of other things to finance as well, so they can never be 100%. But it is an indicator of what, which direction you are going to and, and, uh, and how much you are doing this kind of investments. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and Brian, if you want to come in there, yeah, interested to get, you know, the investor perspective on green bonds being more expensive, basically. Oh, well, it's, it's a very good topic. Um, now, what's my perspective? I, the, the first one is we, when we invest, we are also constrained by the mandates. So for the mandates that are that have got really um, are tight, uh, you know, carbon footprints or ESG cre uh, credentials, then we also have to be seen to respond and and uh, build up uh, you know holdings of green bonds within those portfolios because that's what's going to make us meet meet the mandate. But usually there's a yield sacrifice when you're doing that, especially when you're uh, paying the green premium. Now this is up to the investor. Some, some, uh, some investors are fully aware that they will be sacrificing a little bit of yield, but they are happy with that because it makes them sleep well at night. So from, from, the investors, uh, from a portfolio manager's perspective, um, usually I'm constrained with what, what, uh, what the client wants. And to the extent that the client wants to pay the premium, we, may, we, we pay the green, green premium for them. Um, now, for my other broader mandates which are less constraining i think as an investor i i, I have to justify sacrifice you just to pay for a green premium there are other ways to to reduce the footprint of my portfolio without actually having to pay this green premium so mm -hmm. it, so it's it's that's where I, I end up sitting it's really not um uh, a place where I can just give a personal opinion because my job is constrained by the mandate and I do what the mandate wants, but I wouldn't sure. just sacrifice yield just because I want to be green. I would find ways of reducing my carbon footprint while also meeting the client's mandate. Um, but what are we concerned about uh, as investors when we're just looking at uh, all of this green issuance? I think it's what's been talked about. We're worried about greenwashing. And we're also worried about just unnecessarily paying a green premium because at the end of the day, it's the same entity you're looking at. Mm -hmm. If it's Spain, it's going to be Spain with a green bond or without. So it's all about their ability to pay back. So, so that's how we tend to look at things sometimes. But you can see where I'm split. I sit in a place where I yeah. get told what to do by the client. So my opinion is, yeah. is, not, that, is not that big. Yeah. Um, one, just you, you mentioned there... Um, you know, it's the same issuer, you know, it's the same credit risk. And, and in some sense, that would that would imply the same the same costs. Uh, but um, there is uh, and this is a question from from the audience. There is um, th the issue that uh, when issuing a green bond, there are additional costs. You know, you have to uh, set up the framework and organize the reporting. And uh, these these add to the uh, the cost for the issuer. I imagine there's more setup costs, but there's probably ongoing costs as well. Um, Christian, what what is left of the greenium once you met, once you meet those costs? I mean, of course, there are these kind of costs, but um, at the end of the day, I would say they they don't matter because either you want to do this or you don't want to do this. And um, um, I can only completely um, agree to to to, uh, to Isla and to Brian. If you want to do this, do it do it right and do it uh, do it uh, um, um, uh, completely on 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 this kind on this kind of topic. So um, yes, there are, are uh, first of all there is there's some some upfront costs for putting up the framework, and and at the end of the day there are uh, costs for um, yeah doing the reporting, which is which is not not an easy point. Uh, so but the, at the end of the day, I'm I'm completely convinced that you cannot value the overall costs because and, and I give you an example. So um, especially in Germany, but I think other issues do it the same way. We have um, established uh, some some kind of round table between between many ministries, um, environment, um, economic, and uh, all this, uh, um, um, yeah, and and infrastructure and all 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 this one. And there's a value because they are starting to 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 discuss these kind of points and they're thinking about in a in a capital market view. 
perhaps they are all experts in their in their in, in their topics but bringing this together in an in an in an, in an round table um, opens their mind for perhaps doing exactly that what you want doing more of this uh, just yeah. just uh, just funding more of that and that is something which you care is is at my point of view um uh, I, i'm not able or not smart enough to to value that mm -hmm. progress in in coming together and and discussing all these topics and and having new ideas to say ah that's a good idea let's let's bring this forward and um and ah capital market likes uh, likes having um yeah. this this kind of railway or, or, or and that's something like we've that. heard uh, so at all new, levels not just the sovereign yeah. one right like throughout the corporate it's, sector it's, as well it's yeah. it's coming to new innovations on 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 that and mm -hmm. at the end of the day it it, it's a per, of course a, a surplus um, it, if you draw the big line, um, nobody can tell you uh, how much it is. Um, it, it's, it, it makes sense to, to come together. Um, Ayla mentioned um, um, you don't have to issue green bonds, right? That's that's correct. Way I, I think if I'm informed correctly, Finland does not in um, Finland does not um, issue, but has a very good has a very good transparency about their about their expenditures. So that you can do this the same way, but and. You have then the same the same costs if you if you want um, of putting putting people together, but uh, the influence of putting people together is 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 very valuable. But um, yeah, I think the question is how to quantify that. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of questions from the audience that I'll introduce in a moment. Unless there's anything else you wanted to to add on that, Ella or Brian. Nope. Okay. Not, 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 not really from my side. I just wanted to add that there is some value added for investors. They get a whole lot of information which they don't mm. get the traditional one. So, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, let's hear from uh, from MUFG. We've got Christopher Marks, I believe, is is on the line. Yes, thank you. Uh, who is um, an MD at MUFG and he's head of emerging markets at uh, EMEA. Uh, Christopher, I believe you you had a question. I do, Lewis, and it's a question for Ella, if I may. And I'm speaking rather from older days uh, when indeed Ella and the funding team built the EARN program. And it's really a question about narrative and identity. And naturally, this touches on the role of the EIB as, as an investment instrument over time. And the thing about the EIB in earlier days was the singularity of the institution. It was Europe's issuer and was defined that way. The EARN program itself, moreover, was indeed constructive to create liquidity that on the margin would be an alternative to the Bund and the OATs. As you noted earlier, scarcity and rarity may actually may be, may be different points. But I, I, I'm thinking I was about really you are driven, as you say in your investor presentations, the lending program is driven by EU policy. Now, the EIB has to play a different role. You bounce between your role as the EU bank and thinking of last year's changes, a new development finance emphasis is relevant. On the front page of the EIB most recent investor presentation, it's interesting, is the Wazirzat solar field in Morocco. That's the front page, you know, sort of leading about identity. I've asked you to reflect a little bit, and certainly as your position now as you as you step down, about how you see this tension between the singular identity of the EIB, uh, market relevance, and how you see that narrative evolving. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Yes, I recognize the voice, uh, uh, although I did not see the image, but uh, but I think I still have have a good image in my head. Uh, so. Um, yeah, that's a quite a complex question. I think our identity has evolved from being, <clears throat> well, during uh, some crises as well, uh, like the <clears throat> European crisis. Sorry, <clears throat> we were a bit everything for everybody, and uh, that, of course, being everything from for everybody in large volumes requires capital, which is, again, which is a scarce resource these days for most people, anyways. And I think this has focused our thinking that we are. Uh, an entity, public sector entity, which is getting its capital from the member states. And this capital then, uh, it's not an endless source. Uh, uh, Christian could, uh, could testify to that. Um, it is uh, something that we have to use wisely. And hence we took this view that, okay, we'd better use the public sector funds on something which is 
uh, important for the whole union, which is, for example, then the climate and the environment and, and everything that, that goes with it. And this is why we made this um, <clears throat> just a recent transformation. It's still work ongoing, work in progress. Uh, to, to, to be the climate bank of Europe. So we put a lot of emphasis on this climate, uh, other environmental aspects, and also uh, digitalization is something which is very close to, to our heart as well, because we think that the economy in general in Europe, but also in our partner countries, needs this in order to be able to keep up the growth. If you are, stick, if you are stuck with your old technologies and old ways, you get by for a few uh, for a few more years, but then at some stage these things become more complex for you. And we would rather see that Europe is at the forefront rather than lagging behind. So, um, in that sense, it's a. Uh, I think the identity is that we are whatever EU needs us to be, and uh, we think that this is what we need to be now. And we have, of course, a different role. I mean, we have ESM, who is a crisis resolution mechanism. We have the Commission, who is also. Uh, financing uh, huge amounts these days and partially in similar areas, but they are only financing the public sector, whereas we are working very largely, I mean, much more with the private sector than we are with the public sector. So we each have a role to play there. And I think this is the, this is the identity which is still evolving, but I think we see now the direction pretty clearly where we want to go with this. Does that answer your question at all? It does that. It's simply I'm reflecting also on the commentary at the beginning of the session from Gertian, of course, who talked about the permanence, really, of the ambitions um, of the, which is fine. It's in keeping with new priorities, but it naturally, it, it constrains and obliges the rethinking a little bit of the relevance of the EIB, not just, it's not just a Luxembourg-based World Bank. Um, and that's really, if you think of the direction of things, it's it's really, for someone like Brian, you have to be relevant every day. Um, and that's really the context, rather than placing you in a different place in his own allocations. That's really yeah. the context. But, but Christopher, we were never the World Bank in Luxembourg, so that was never our role to be. So uh, World Bank is also partially a, a crisis uh, response mechanism, which we have been that, but only for the private sector and to keep keep the investments and the economy going. We have never been the ones who lend uh, to governments, give budget support to governments, who talk to the governments about uh, economic reform programs. That was never our role. Uh, even during the crisis, what we did was to keep the economy going, to keep the, when, for example, private sector banks have to, had to withdraw to a large extent from financing the economy like we saw during the financial crisis uh, so this is this is something that 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 uh, that was where we stepped in which was our role so uh, in that sense it's it's not that different it's just that the the objectives are changing i would say yeah fair enough thank you very much um, thanks very much for that question, uh, Christopher. Great to hear from you. And uh, I'll, I think I'll introduce now uh, from TD Securities, Mark Byrne, who I believe has a question as well. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And, and, and thank you so far. Really interesting discussion uh, so, so far this morning. Um, I just want to move on to a slightly different topic that we haven't covered yet. And I believe it might be covered in the next session. So apologies. Um, but just on the topic of digitalization and the use of blockchain technology. Um, you know, obviously, following on from the EIB digital bond, um, the question really is where do you, it's quite an open question, where do you see the use of blockchain te technology in the future? Um, really, is it an industry wide you know, revolution that's going to dramatically change how we conduct our syndications in our daily lives? Or is it just simply a very useful technology that perhaps impacts operations and settlements, but not necessarily something that's going to ch change the landscape of our of our daily lives? Uh, thanks for that, Mark. Uh, as the editor of the Digital Monetary Institute, this is a, a very interesting question for me as well. Um, so uh, does anyone, uh, Christian, would you like to address that? Or any of yeah, I mean, uh, Anna is, of course, the, the early, more, uh, early mover uh, again, but um, also Germany has done some, some, test, uh, some testing and we, have, uh, we were involved um, in some tests with Deutsche Börse and, uh, and Bundesbank. Um, it was more on the on the payment side um, that they tried to um, they tried to um, um, to establish um, 
something without the digital uh, digital money um, on on the ledger it was some sort of something something like a trigger chain. Nevertheless, um, and this is um, this is a topic where we're looking into that. Um, we're just closely looking into that, and of course there are um, on the paper there are advantages, um, back office and 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 and, and, and things like things like that. As of now, I don't see any big break, uh, big big rule breaker in the market for in the financial market as well. But nevertheless, this could this could change um, from one day to to another. Um, I mean, using the blockchain technology and being a, a, a green bond issuer is always um, a very tricky question. You have to have to take care about your energy um, um, uh, sources and uh, what what is needed for for all these mining capacities. Um, yeah, short answer. We're looking to that interesting, interesting topic. So far, we don't have a clear strategy where it would would like. Um, I mean, as a, as an issue, we will we will always be a market taker. So we look to the market, and we will we try to be um, um, with the curve, uh, if if like that. So and, and and if there are changes in the market, we will be there. Um, I see uh, as of now many problems unsolved from the legal uh, from a legal perspective know your customer and all these all these topics and um, at the end of the day uh, or at, on, on the other part i see i see many pros um very very simple very simple back office and, and custodian topics but um yeah uh, very interesting and it's a topic and living project for us mm. fantastic um uh Ayla, brian would you like to add anything on that I'm not smart <laughs> enough. I'm not smart enough for uh, for blockchain, and so so it's all it's all Yeah, I I was just going to say a disclaimer as well that I'm too much of a dinosaur to talk uh, intelligently about blockchain, but but um, our, our experience was that yes, it definitely has some advantages. It is still very very early days, so we could see that if things went to, into this and that direction, one could see that this could be a very useful tool in finance as well. I think that blockchain is now being tested and used in very many fields of, of, of life as well as a sort of way to prove authenticity. I just bought a bottle of vinegar, which says on the etiquette that uh, proof of authenticity by, by blockchain, which I was stunned to see, to be honest. So so it, it, we, we don't see yet where we are going. This The technology is too new. And our, our, our experience was that it was a huge amount of work uh, surprisingly, especially from the legal and compliance side, less from the technical side. Um, and and um, but we are testing. This is also something that we like to 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 develop. And then we'll see, uh, like the green bonds, when we did the first one in 2007, we had absolutely no idea if it would ever take on by um, by the by the by the wider world. And here is where we are today. So I say the same about blockchain. Let's let's see in 15 years time where we are. Yeah. Yeah, I do think the, the certificate of authenticity idea is something that in, in terms of the use of proceeds for green bonds that could there's there's a, a clear sort of uh, application there. Um, thanks for your question, Mark. Uh, there will, I'm sure, be more on that in, in, in the next panel and in, uh, certainly in, uh, in other panels that, uh, that I'll be doing, hopefully, <laughs> uh, to come. Um, I'm just going to go to another uh, quick question from the from the audience. I know we're, we're running short of time, but we've got time for for a couple of others. Um, one for you, Brian, um, you know, based on your, your growth and interest rate outlook for the, for the Euro area, um, you've mentioned a couple of times that uh, you're expecting, um, you're expecting growth uh, in the EU to be, to be very strong. Uh, and yeah, so are you expecting that to, to translate into strength for the Euro or given, you know, we're looking at interest rate differentials between the US and, and the, the rest of the G10, will that kind of keep the Euro down? And uh, depending on your answer to that, how will the ECB be reacting to, to that? Let's bring back to my sell side days. Someone's just asking me for a trade idea there, which is, which is quite good. Um, the, uh, uh, I think monetary policy divergence is going to play a big role. So if the Federal Reserve were to deliver those four hikes, plus do quantitative tightening, I think that then translates into a, uh, a stronger dollar, especially versus the euro, because the ECB is still expanding its balance sheet. 
and is unlikely to be hiking this year. So I think monetary policy divergence is going to be one of the biggest drivers superseding the fact that Europe is going to be uh, growing very well. So I think I'm not expecting like a one-way train where the dollar just rallies to the moon. But I think on balance, if you told me, is the euro likely to be at 119 or at 110 by the end of this year, I would say more likely 110 than 119. Just basically, if the Fed delivers what it's expecting to do, then I think I think the dollar is bound to be stronger. On the other side as well, is you have to look at what's happening in other major economies to then have a view on the dollar, which then informs your view on the euro. I.e., the BOJ is talking a little bit about tightening, but they are very much unlikely to tighten under Corona. So that's flat rates most likely for this year. Uh, and then if you look at the, uh, the, the PBOC, it's actually started easing policy and it started making noises about an expensive yuan. So if you look at the dollar, you have to look at the other anti-dollar currencies. And I tend to look at the euro, the yen, and, and, and the yuan. And those three to me are unlikely to do anything because the central banks don't want them to do anything. And on the other side, the dollar is being supported by the Fed. So in my modeling, just as a final point, in my modeling, I look, I look at inflation, inflation adjusted yields and the differentials between the US and the rest of the world. And just looking at those real yield differentials gives you an indication that you can't expect a weak dollar this year unless something else happens. But based on the information we have now, the dollar has to be stronger. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I, I, yes, somebody asked a question about this earlier. Um, a couple of times we've touched on the the importance of the NGEU program and, um, you know, the status that uh, that those bonds are, are coming to, to have. And somebody's asked if um, could I if I can ask Brian if I can if you would consider EU bonds substitutes with US Treasuries uh, as a bond portfolio manager, I, I guess. I mean, if you're working in euros, it'll be, uh, well, uh, not to, to, to find a point on it, Christian's bonds. Um, uh, but yeah, what, what's your perspective on uh, the EU, I guess, becoming the sort of common eurozone safe asset and, uh, you know, taking on a role that, that the Bund has sort of traditionally filled? So my, my straight answer is yes. Um, yeah, yes, you're, you have a large supra. Uh, coordinated political action there. So yes, I think in terms of substitution, I would say, yeah, very much so. Um, in terms of uh, portfolio performance, and like you rightly say, it depends on from which jurisdiction you're coming from. But I think if you're coming from Japan and then hedging these instruments, I think they are very close in you to, to, to Treasury. So that just makes them, you know, more substitutes. Um, the EU is, 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 you know, ramped up issuance, so liquidity is no longer an issue and it trades really tight to, 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 uh, to, to the burn. So again, when I look at all of those things, liquidity, volume of issuance and if you're hedging, say, if you're a foreigner uh, hedging uh, the, these instruments when you buy them, I think eventually you just come very close to treasuries. So my answer is a very strong yes. Excellent. And and Christian, uh, do you have a perspective on that? I mean, is there a, a competitive element with the, the EU bonds uh, filling a sort of similar role? Um, I mean, the decision um, if they play a similar role is not is not taken by us as an as an um, as an issuer. It's it's taken by the market. So therefore, um, um, if if they're um, if they're seen as euro as euro area benchmark is is a decision by by, by markets. And um, if they are um, what what we what we can see is is just the, the level of interest rates of interest rates levels so and therefore uh, bonds are still are still um, lower and, and the EU com is, is around about 30 basis points higher or something like that um, as, as mentioned I mean there's no there's no competition about about that we're supporting our friends in in in, uh, in, in Luxembourg um, therefore um, but um, at the end of the day it's a, it's a question of it's a question of, of market um, perspective. And um, when I see what um, at the end of the day, at the end of the year of, of last year, there were some, um, um, yeah, some 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 kind of, of in, in the in the repo market, um, German bonds were very much um, there was a high a high demand for them, and um, as you, as it was reflected in the in the repo rates, so therefore. Um, so my impression is that the market is still is still seeing Germany as as a government in, in investor and uh, EUcom 
within the within the um, SSA segment. But um, but if it's if it's if it's arranged as an agency or a government, is is not something which we can decide. It's up to up to the markets and up to any investor. I mean, this could be could be um, decided um, by any investor by itself. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, I think maybe one here for, uh, well, possibly for everyone, but but, but maybe more for Ayla. Um, where do you see the the optimal in in the green bond market? Um, where do you see the optimal balance of focus between uh, harmonizing taxonomies and tracking of first principles and um, proper attribution of of externalities and uh, and the efficiency of uh, of, the, uh, of the solution. Oh, I think Ayla might have frozen. Uh, we may we may have lost Ayla. Um, uh, well, hopefully, hopefully she uh, she comes back. Um, yeah, yeah, I think she is. Uh, she's frozen. Um, okay. Um, um, maybe I'll just uh, one of the other questions, if I can just uh, throw this. Uh, to Christian as well. This is uh, something that uh, I think Brian touched on uh, as well, but um, we've got an audience members asking for uh, an attitude. So the we mentioned the, the stability and growth pact earlier, um, and you know we talked a little bit about the the more sort of relaxed attitude to returning to the to the constraints it imposes. Um, so the question is, is that more relaxed attitude acceptable to, to frugal countries given inflation is getting to 3%? Well, again, um, for me as a debt manager, um, 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 please, please um, accept that. I, I, sure. I, I'm not able to answer that in a, in a, in a, concrete, in a concrete way. Um, this this has to be has to be decided by by politician by politicians and, and it's our job to, um, to to fulfill the needs the borrowing needs which we which we have on the on on, on the table as now. Um, I, I mean the, the tricky question is 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 about the inflation you, you mentioned um, um, and um, I mean even even ECB is puzzled uh, about. Um, how long will it be there? Um, the, the high rates and how, how much, uh, how deep will it go go back down? So therefore, um, um, I'm to 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 cite my my colleagues. I'm not smart enough to um, to to have a to, to have a better view on that. Um, perhaps inflation is going back to under two percent. So then we have then, then the question takes it the other way around. So. Mm. Um, all right. Well, fantastic. I think um, given we uh, we've lost Ayla, I hope we're not dropping like flies. I think we should um, let's let's uh, wind up there. Is there anything that you wanted to uh, to add, Brian? Uh, anything you wanted to just to finish off? Uh, not, not not much to add from my side. I think uh, from an investor perspective, we are very optimistic about Europe. Um, they're doing the right things. So, and like I was saying before. In the past, we were concerned about this, the, the dysfunction and the impact of that dysfunction on growth, uh, solvency and liquidity and you name it. All those concerns are gone now. The idea of yields going up or down, it's part of the cycle, right? They can't just go one way. It's part of the cycle. We talk about uh, you know 25 basis points rise only because we're coming from deeply negative territory. But in the grand scheme of things, this is really nothing. So. Mm. Am I really optimistic that European issuance will be taken down quite quite well this year? Yes, I am. Uh, and if yields go up, even better for us investors, more concession, a bit, bit of value, a bit of yield pickup, and, and off we go. But these things go in cycles. So we might get obsessed by inflation this time around. But come the end of the year, this goes, we're talking about something else. So these are all just cycles. In the, in the end, I think Europe in a very, is in a very strong footing. And obviously, I do hope that Bundy will go to three percent sometime soon, but uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, anything from you, Christian, to, to finish off? No, I think I think we touched it. We touched the points, and uh, as Brian mentioned, as Brian mentioned, um, perhaps a little bit less excitement um, if German, German ten-year bond is crossing the zero from above or from below. That's um, yeah, that's part of the that's part of the circle. I just uh, it's a very good, a very good uh, closing um, statement. I would say from from Brian and I would um, I would agree, agree to that. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, a nice a nice note to end on then. Some some optimism for for European growth and, and perspective about about the cycle. So, uh, I, I want to thank uh, well, all three of my panelists. Only only two of them have made it to to this stage. But uh, thanks very much to Ayla. Thanks to Christian, and, and thank you very much to, to to you, Brian, as well. Uh, thank you to um to those of you who asked questions and and uh and to all of our audience. Um, I think it's been a really interesting panel. Uh. A heads up, we have, um, I guess, a nine minute break now. The next panel will be starting at uh, 10.30 UK, 11.30 uh, CET, and that will be on um, financing for the future. So green and digitalization projects. So maybe possibly a little bit, a little bit more on the, uh, on the topics we touched on here. Um, uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks once again for, for joining and thanks to my panelists and uh, I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>